Good morning. Thank you for joining the launch of the GPMB's 2023 report on the state of the world's preparedness. I am delighted to be here to present the findings of this report together with my co-chair, Joy Pumapi, and fellow board members. Towards the end of the session, we will have a question and answer session. My colleagues in the GPMB Secretariat are monitoring the Zoom chat function. As you listen to our presentations, we ask that you paste any questions that you have into this function. We will collate these and will endeavor to address them in the Q&A session. It is now my pleasure to introduce the report. This is the GPMB's fourth report on preparedness. Our first report came just before the COVID-19 pandemic started. The second and third were published during the pandemic response. This 2023 report, by contrast, focuses on the state of the world's preparedness in the immediate aftermath of COVID-19. The board describes the state as fragile, progress is precarious, and decline is extensive. The cover of the report features the Cuesta Huachaca Bridge, the last surviving traditional Inca rope bridge. Every year, four surrounding communities come together to rebuild it. The bridge represents fragility, but also the security that can only be guaranteed by working together on an equal footing. Many people are working to patch up preparedness to prevent us from falling back into the cycle of panic and neglect. However, we lack the solid foundations needed to ensure current efforts for preparedness can be brought together to build an enduring bridge to a state of security. This is made more fragile by lack of trust, both between and within countries. To counter mistrust, we need to address its root causes, which is why this GPMB report places great emphasis on equity, accountability and leadership and coherence as underpinning factors for preparedness. The key takeaways from the board's report is that our ability to deal with the potential new pandemic threat remains inadequate and the world has insufficient capacities to guarantee our safety. Encouragingly, there have been some areas of advancement. Improvements in preparedness can be seen in relation to the development of a WHO pandemic agreement, community engagement, and in regional laboratory capacity. However, these improvements require sustained reinforcement. In some areas, we see decline from already low levels of preparedness. These include in global R&D coordination, efforts to address misinformation and participation of low and middle income countries in the governance of pandemic preparedness. There are also gaps in independent monitoring and financing. In the report, we call these shortcomings canary in the coal mine issues because these are the earliest signals of systematic problems. Without concrete commitments for financing and monitoring, Preparedness capacities are likely to regress further over the coming years. Our 2023 report finds preparedness needs exist within a challenging context of issues such as conflict, economic crisis, and climate change. These factors only exacerbate pandemic risks. However, I am equally certain that we can and must find ways to invest together in health and in the common good, including through current global health reforms and ongoing negotiations for the WHO pandemic agreement. I now turn to my co-chair, Joy, to share more about the report. Thank you. Thank you, Colinda. This 2023 annual report is special because it is the first GPMB report to be based on our monitoring framework for preparedness. The GPMB's monitoring framework is a set of indicators that was developed through a two-year process with over 100 experts from different sectors to whom we asked what indicators are most relevant, actionable, and impactful in improving preparedness. 
of the 90 indicators developed by the framework, for the framework, the board assessed 30, which describe the current state of equity, leadership, and accountability, and coherence. You will see on your screens a heat map of the assessments included in the report. Each indicator area has been scored, first through expert assessment and then by the board. The assessment considers two elements for each indicator. First, it considers whether a capacity is fully in place based on a score of zero to three, where three colored in green is fully met. There is no green in this heat map. We didn't assess a single capacity as fully met, which is deeply disappointing. Second, the assessment considers whether preparedness in that area has improved or worsened or remained in the same in the past year. You will notice the balance of up and down arrows denoting an era of flux. Our board members will provide more insight into these scores and how our assessment has helped us develop recommendations for action by the global community. Some areas of progress have been encouraging, including efforts to improve R&D and One Health surveillance capacity. Many of these happened as a direct result of COVID-19. However, areas of decline are deeply troubling, including, as Colinda has said, the failure to increase preparedness financing to meet the needs identified since COVID-19, and the failure to integrate independent monitoring into reforms. Without sufficient resources and independent evidence, the world would not have systems in place to equitably prevent and respond to future pandemics. The four report recommendations call for actions to address the critical weaknesses that have been identified in this report. First, we call for actions to strengthen pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, monitoring and accountability, which must be fully integrated into PPR governance, particularly in the WHO pandemic agreement. Second, we call for the PPR financing system to be strengthened. We recommend addressing how countries access financing and to find new sources of financing that are more equitable and sustainable. Our third recommendation articulates the need to strengthen regional animal and human health R&D capacities, including early detection, surveillance systems and laboratories, manufacturing and deployment of medical countermeasures, and agile stock management. For instance, through my work with African heads of state and government and working with the Africa CDC, I see the ways that many countries in Africa are working to improve human vaccine manufacturing and distribution of infrastructure. Finally, multi-sectoral preparedness and cooperation should engage all relevant actors and all relevant sectors, including civil society and the private sector. I would now like to welcome my fellow board members to present our assessments. Bente Angel Hansen will describe the GPMB's findings on monitoring and accountability. Over to you, Bente. Thank you, Joy. Monitoring is a critically important aspect of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response and includes self-assessment, peer review and independent evidence-based monitoring. It is the basis for identifying gaps and weaknesses in PPPR, for sharing learning and for ensuring accountability. Without monitoring, there is no way of determining whether steps to strengthen PPPR are adequate and effective. We saw in the COVID-19 pandemic existing mechanisms for assessing country capacities did not accurately predict readiness for health emergencies. Monitoring of PPPR is complex. It needs to include the many different sectors and stakeholders that play a role. Our assessment reveals that current mechanisms for PPPR monitoring and accountability do not provide a complete picture. They tend to focus on systems and capacities and give less attention to important aspects of leadership, effectiveness and equity. 
they are mostly based on self-assessment with limited independent monitoring. Pictured here are the monitoring and accountability indicators from the GPMB monitoring framework. Our assessment shows that independent monitoring is declining. This was demonstrated by the failure to include a commitment to independent monitoring in the political declaration of the recent UN high-level meeting on PPPR and in the draft negotiation, negotiating text for the WHO pandemic agreement. This is a matter of great concern. Universal periodic review has improved largely through the introduction of a pilot of universal health and preparedness reviews. The global capacity for monitoring and accountability of PPPR remains inadequate. An international agreement is a viable way to codify monitoring and compliance. Currently, the drafts of the WHO pandemic agreement and IHR amendments do not include provisions for facts-based independent monitoring. We believe this is a critical weakness and strongly encourage member states to include independent monitoring in their negotiations. The pandemic influenza preparedness framework is a concrete example of how independent monitoring can be incorporated into an agreement. I had the privilege of co-chairing the negotiations on this framework, which was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2011. The PIP framework includes an independent advisory group which monitors the implementation of the framework and provides evidence-based reporting. This was possible in 2011. It should be possible in 2024, not least in light of the devastating consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's now my pleasure to hand over to my colleague Naoko Ishii, who will present the GPMB assessment of financing in health emergency preparedness. Thank you, Bentes. The financing of PPPL remains one of the greatest sticking points for preparedness. The world's failure to commit to adequate, sustainable financing is a key finding in the board's analysis. As you will see on the heat map, the lowest scoring financing capacity are global search financing and global common good financing represented here in red. It's difficult to assess how much money was provided for the overall COVID-19 response. COVID-19 funding was provided from a wide range of actors and dispersed on an ad hoc basis, which led to a lack of coordination and mismatch between needs and timely availability. This greatly impacted the response and made the global effort to improve access to medical countermeasures more challenging. With the end of pandemic, most of this financing has disappeared. The pandemic fund has struggled to meet the 10 billion US dollar needs identified by G20 high level independent panel on PPPL, of which I am honored to be a member. Yet during its first funding round, the fund was 23 times oversubscribed, showing that there are significant needs at the country level. Surge financing sources like the WHO Contingency Fund for Emergencies have not been sufficiently replenished, and only 40% of countries have domestic contingency funds that could be used for health emergency. Across the board, our assessment shows that financing for PPPL is highly inadequate. The problem it's not only the amount of financing available, we have also assessed a declining score for effectiveness and alignment 
of preparedness spending. For example, one study identified more than 1,000 donors and over 1 million transactions to finance PPPR since 2014 within a funding environment that lacks overall coordination. And in my experience working in development finance, I have seen how national debt hinders spending on health. Economists have not recovered fully yet that from the COVID-19 pandemic, overseas development assistance has shifted to address other crises. A recent UN report has shown that the growing number of countries are spending more on debt servicing than on health. Countries are facing shrinking fiscal space and new crises and are no longer making the needed investment in PPPR. We need a fundamental reform to global financial architecture to realize global search financing and global common goods financing. And we must continue to invest equitably in preparedness to avoid the much greater cost of failed pandemic response. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Irona Kikvos, who will present the GPMB assessment of global governance in health emergency preparedness. Thank you. Thank you, Naoko. Thank you very much. Uh, many of you know that I have studied global governance for decades, including as chair of the Global Health Center here in, the, in Geneva, through my work with Germany on G20 and G7 initiatives, through my participation here in the GPMB, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All, and the review of WHO's response to Ebola. Based on this experience, I want to reiterate a key finding and concern of this report, which is that over the years of our work, global health has become more crowded, much too crowded probably, and the governance of PPPR is deeply fragmented and lacks coherence. Some of us feel like in a Hollywood movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> On your screens, you can see the board's assessment for global governance of preparedness. It shows a very mixed picture, but none of the capacities we assess this year are adequate. And this after so many decades of work in this issue. There are multiple parallel efforts, some of which overlap, but which still leave gaps, particularly in relation to equity research and development, and access to medical countermeasures. There is no strategic plan to coordinate the whole of UN, whole of society response to health emergencies, and our governance structure struggle to provide the necessary leadership and unity to guide us through the pandemic. What is more, far too little attention is paid to how efforts should interrelate and what a coherent global health architecture should look like, with form often being prioritized over function. The WHO pandemic agreement will, of course, be of critical importance for the future of PPPR governance, working in complement but going beyond the reforms of the international health regulations. The board has expressed concern in relation to the speed of negotiations on the agreement and for the challenges and divides that are holding back progress. Member states must redouble efforts to finalize the agreement before May 2024 when the World Health Assembly meets. Our collective preparedness against the next pandemic depends on it. A unique challenge for PPPR governance is that pandemics are cross-cutting and impact upon all of society as we have experienced. This means that multiple sectors need to be integrated into governance. 
the GPMB finds tentative progress in governance of multi-sectoral preparedness. The political declaration of the high-level meeting on PPPR at the UN General Assembly this September, which was adopted, makes commitments to multi-sectoral preparedness, but stops short of concrete commitments, deferring these to the WHO pandemic agreement. WHO is engaging and working more with non-health sectors, and member states' own engagement with preparedness has increased through WHO pandemic agreement negotiations. However, gaps still remain in civil society and private sector engagement. I want to end on a positive note. This report finds that over the course of the COVID-19 response, Member States have recognized WHO's vital and central role in health emergency response. They have demonstrated their renewed trust in WHO by increasing their assessed contributions. To correct the incoherence that has plagued PPPR governance, this empowerment of WHO at the center of global health is essential complemented with efforts to strengthen the whole of UN multi-sectoral response to pandemics. I will now hand over to my colleague, Victor Tsao, who will present the GPMB assessment of R&D in health emergency preparedness. Victor, please. Thank you, Ilona. So I have spent my career in medical research and development including now in my role as the president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. Certainly, it's quite exciting that R&D for pandemic response product is a field with unprecedented scientific advances, notably the dramatic shortening of time needed to develop vaccines and other countermeasures. The 100-day mission launched by G7 in 2021 aims to reduce this time period even further, and I'm honored to chair the Science Technology Expert Group that supports this mission. However, our report shows that science cannot save the world alone. Without effective governance, resources, and capacity to ensure equitable access to these products. You would have seen from the heat map that pandemic R&D and access to countermeasures remains insufficient across all the indicators that we assessed, although there's been some improvements. Global spending R&D overall is a record high, almost 1.7 trillion US dollars per year. But 80% of spending is concentrated in 10 countries, most of which are high income. Yet we lack an effective global mechanism to set priorities and coordinate pandemic R&D which means that the world cannot prioritize countermeasures development for the high-risk pathogens and deliver, de deliver pandemic products based on need. Low- and middle-income countries are inadequately represented in decision-making and coordination processes. This means that their needs are poorly met in resource allocation. Regional strengthening and capacity building is one essential counter to this unbalanced concentration of resource and control. And as co-chair of the Regional Vaccine Manufacturing Collaborative, this is certainly a subject that I'm very passionate about. But there's a mixed picture in relation to regional capacity building. Many seedling initiatives which were initiated in low and middle income countries during and since COVID-19, but it's unclear today whether these will succeed and be sustainable. These include technology transfer initiatives, networks and collaborations to build capacity. To meet their potential, they need to be scaled up and secured. And regional manufacturing is unevenly concentrated, leaving a dangerous reliance on imports during health emergencies. These gaps mean market forces predominantly dominate, resulting in a world where access to product is largely based on 
ability to pay. The world saw results of this in the inequitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. So without systemic change, we must anticipate the same result in the future. Now to end on a more positive note, there have been concentrated efforts to build capacity in, regional, in several regions, including Africa, the Asian region, and Latin America. However, these efforts are fragile and need continued attention to build and sustain. I will now hand over to my colleague, Maha Aurabat, who present the GPMB assessment of inclusivity and health emergency preparedness. Over to you, Maha. Victor, thank you very much, Victor. And uh, well, uh, through my professional work implementing equitable interventions for universal health coverage, including during um, emerg health emergencies at the local, national, and global levels, I have seen that equity and fairness are never and could never be achieved without empowering communities and creating trust especially so during health emergencies. That is why our board's assessment has emphasized the gaps in adequate capacities for community engagement, participation, communication, and management of misinformation. There has been some progress realized in this area. However, it remains inadequate. We have seen an improvement of low and middle income country inclusion, participation in the PPR, governance through the INB, the IHR amendment processes, but measures to include civil society and the private sector are not fully effective, thus limiting their meaningful engagement and health contribution. At every level, the local, national, regional, and global, we have observed that insufficient attention is paid to the composition of decision-making bodies and there are very little efforts to ensure that women, youth, vulnerable groups such as refugees, asylum seekers, or ethnic minorities are included in the PPR. There is also no global strategy to address the impact of health emergencies on these groups, despite the fact that they were the most affected during the COVID-19 pandemic. The draft negotiating text of the WHO pandemic agreement does try to address this, and we hope that member states will maintain that focus. Community engagement and misinformation and, mis and information sharing had significantly progressed during the pandemic. However, evidence shows that this progress is not sustained. Much of these efforts have been focused more on pandemic response rather than preparedness and have not been sustained after the initial crisis phase ended. The weakest area, however, is the management of misinformation, where we found poor to no capacity. Misinformation and disinformation about health emergencies is everywhere, especially so on social media. One 2022 study found that 20 to 30 percent of YouTube videos about emerging infectious diseases contained inaccurate or misleading information. In more and more countries, there is increasing mistrust between communities, governments, and the private sector. And despite this, we have found that there is currently no global mechanism established to deal with health-related misinformation and disinformation. There are a growing number of initiatives at the global and at regional levels to identify and track misinformation and disinformation, but they remain uncoordinated and have limited scope to intervene. So now I pass over to my colleague, Matthew Stone, to present the GPMB assessment of One Health in Health Emergency Preparedness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mara. Tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to all, but particularly greetings to Indigenous communities around the world. We are seeing something of a renaissance in appreciation of the One Health approach, particularly in the context of pandemic risk, climate change, and biodiversity threats. We should acknowledge 
that understanding the deep connection between human, animal, and ecosystem health is ancient wisdom for most indigenous communities. The One Health approach is one of the areas of the monitoring framework that has shown some progress since the COVID-19 pandemic. Initiatives for One Health threats and early warning surveillance are being strengthened, and at the global level, this is structured on coordination across the quadripartite agencies. This high-level coordination must still be translated into shared preparedness priorities and aligned implementation efforts. We need the understanding of animal and ecosystem health to be integrated into policy for human health and well-being in a more genuine manner. The One Health approach must be more deeply integrated into policy making, governance instruments, and programming for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. The board is pleased to see that the current draft negotiating text of the WHO pandemic agreement has progressed on this issue and now includes actionable proposals for One Health. Additional progress on One Health governance includes the adoption of the quadripartite's One Health Joint Plan of Action for 2022 to 2026, and the quadripartite's One Health High-Level Expert Panel is providing expert input on key topics, such as surveillance. At the regional level, laboratory capacities for diagnostic services and research and their practices with respect to biosafety and biosecurity are being re reinforced following COVID-19. These capacities are often disease specific and vary extensively between regions. Regional laboratories that played an important role during COVID-19 must now develop a full set of generic capacities that can be adapted across a range of threats. At the country level, the picture is less positive. Most IHR state parties do report some One Health activities, but these activities are often concentrated on a specific disease, such as influenza or rabies, or specific issue, such as antimicrobial resistance. These programs have been important priorities to foster the One Health approach, but the learnings from them should develop into a mature, integrated One Health systems thinking applied widely across health programs. In several countries, human health surveillance is already a great challenge, animal health surveillance often even more so. And so integrating systems for One Health insights has not been prioritised. GPMB hopes global efforts will build on global One Health priorities and the examples of One Health services integration and cross-sectoral support during the pandemic to result in better national integration of One Health preparedness in the future. I will now pass to my colleague, Mark Lowcock, who will present the GPMB assessment of multi-sectoral coordination in health emergency preparedness. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Major crises, including pandemics, require a whole of society response. When I was the UN's emergency relief coordinator, I saw the many ways in which responses fail in practice without adequate coordination. And that's why it's a huge concern that coordination for pandemic preparedness and response remains very weak. Most mechanisms for coordination which are created during health emergencies have been time limited and ad hoc. While the board's assessment shows that there have been some recent improvements in coordination on trade issues, Overall, the involvement of the key actors in response and preparedness is highly inconsistent, and it's getting worse. 
in a health emergency, lots of different players need to be mobilized quickly and effectively. And that means you need ways of overseeing and coordinating between all the elements of response, the health elements, education, trade, supply chains, transport, and so on. Our world is increasingly complex and interconnected. Actions in one place have unexpected consequences elsewhere. How, for example, will a country's adoption of trade measures impact on the access of health care in another country? How will a lockdown measure impact on access to education? We need to better understand and manage these trade-offs and inter interdependencies. The failures we saw in the early response to COVID-19 exemplify what happens when the right coordination is missing. We saw countries implement a range of measures, export bans, trade barriers, travel restrictions and border closures, each with their own independent rationale, but without an understanding of the holistic overall health and socioeconomic outcomes. Effective responses can't rely on ad hoc mechanisms initiated months after the start of a health emergency. They depend on organizations across sectors being well prepared and working together long in advance of a pandemic. But unfortunately, we have no mechanism to systematically engage different sectors and actors in preparedness. While there is some coordination across multilateral institutions working on One Health, most preparedness efforts at the national and global levels is being done in silos. There's also no clear process to involve the private sector and civil society in preparedness, especially when it comes to setting priorities and coordination. The pandemic influenza preparedness framework offers a potential model. There are proposals to improve all this, which are being debated, including through the pandemic agreement and the United Nations Secretary General's proposal for an emergency platform. But in the meantime, far too many gaps remain. I'll now hand over to our co-chairs who will begin the presentation of the report's recommendations. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for presenting these uh, findings from the technical assessments. And let us now turn to the question of what we need to do about them focusing on four areas where the most persistent gaps remain or where we've seen the most decline at the global level. These are first, monitoring and accountability, second, financing, third, R&D and supply chain capabilities, and fourth, multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder engagements. I will get us started uh, with the first one on monitoring and accountability. My colleague Bente told us about declining monitoring capabilities, and I think everyone will agree that we have seen the impacts of inadequate monitoring during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many countries believed they were well prepared when we heard of a new respiratory pathogen. The challenges we faced in responding to COVID-19 took us all by surprise. Even countries with great surveillance systems struggled to track cases. Countries with the best R&D had to deal with vaccine hesitancy, and countries with top health systems were short of staff and ICU beds. In other words, we were missing critical tools that could have helped us prevent, mitigate, or respond to COVID-19 much more effectively and rapidly. We were missing accurate knowledge on the state of global and national preparedness and on the actions needed to address any gaps. And we were also missing the kind of high level political attention and commitment that such tools can help galvanize. This is why our calls to, to strengthen monitoring and accountability is our first and arguably our most important recommendation. As you will see from the slide behind me, we're calling for the strengthening of monitoring and accountability systems at all levels through three actions. First, by improving national monitoring of PPPR. Second, by investing in better data and evidence collection. And third, by strengthening global multi-sectoral and independent monitoring. 
National monitoring capabilities help countries, institutions, and communities assess risks and track their own capacities to respond based on their specific context, needs, and resources. They help countries facilitate prioritization and targeting of investment. In other words, they help put countries back in the driver's seat. Also, when combined with peer reviews and evidence-based independent monitoring, national monitoring exercises can help increase trust. As such, we believe that an improved universal periodic peer review mechanism, as well as a conference of parties, should be incorporated into WHO pandemic agreement to track progress with the implementation of the agreement and support compliance. Our second point concerns the quality of the data that informs strong monitoring frameworks. Indeed, uh, there are major blind spots in our understanding of PPPR because we haven't invested enough in data collection capacities at all levels. We have important knowledge gaps. How many vaccines could we produce in the event of another pandemic? Would it be sufficient to vaccinate the world? How much money are we spending on preparedness and response? How effective is the spending? Until we build better data collection capacity, we won't know how to target our investments in PPPR. Last but not least, we call for strengthening global multi-sectoral independent monitoring. Independent monitoring provides the most objective, transparent, impartial, evidence and science-based expert assessment of PPPR. A model like the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has showed us how effective a global expert-driven monitoring mechanism can be in raising awareness and driving action to address a catastrophic threat like climate change or pandemics. As the GPMB reaches the end of its first mandate, we believe it is a good time to reflect and consider how it can evolve into a more robust, multi-sectoral, independent monitoring mechanism. Let me conclude this recommendation with an important point. In fact, for many people watching this, it is the elephant in the room. And that is the idea that independent monitoring represents a threat to sovereignty or that it will inevitably entail punishment or blame or forced intervention. As a former president, I am well aware of these concerns, believe me. But independent monitoring should not be about blame or punishment. In fact, well-designed monitoring should and can support national action plans and priorities. Thank you and over to you, Joy, for our second recommendation. Thank you so much, uh, Colinda. And you finished your remarks with an elephant in the room. And I'm going to start mine with another, because my remarks are about financing. After the unprecedented spending we saw during COVID, many governments have stopped investing in preparedness, turning to other urgent priorities requiring attention, like conflicts, climate change, and regaining lost progress uh, on the SDGs. Uh, Post-pandemic inflammatory pressures and a slow global economy have shrunk government revenues and along with it, government spending. As we have heard from my colleagues, many capacities that we were building during COVID are being lost and much work is needed to strengthen pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. Be that as it may, now is not the time to stop investing. Indeed, we must find ways to spend better in a more strategic way, something that monitoring can help us achieve. This means addressing the most urgent funding gaps and aligning financing around people, around communities, national, regional, as well as global priorities and needs. We must also find new ways of financing PPR that really relies less on development assistance and more on domestic and new sources of sustainable financing. I know this is a tall order. It is complex and it will take time, but we cannot afford to wait for another year to get started on the right actions. On the slide, in our second recommendation, 
we call for a reform of the global financing system for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response by fully financing the pandemic fund as a matter of agency, reviewing its funding mod model in the long term, and finding new ways of financing preparedness capacities and surge financing for emergency response. The pandemic fund has struggled to raise sufficient funds to meet the US dollar 10 billion a year gap identified by the G20 uh, HLIP. As the largest dedicated international mechanism to fund pandemic preparedness, prevention and response, world leaders, both from the public and private sectors, should ensure it is sufficiently resourced. We encourage a broad range of donors to contribute to the fund, including philanthropies, foundations, and the private sector. The GPMB strongly believes that to be predictable and sustainable, funding cannot rely mainly on replenishment donor models, especially one based on ODA. The fund's model should evolve towards a more sustainable collective financing mechanism that engages everyone. Beyond the pandemic fund, the full global financing system should also prioritize funding pandemic prevention and uh, preparedness as a fundamental dimension of advancing well-being and supporting economic stability, integrating it into all development financing. International financing institutions should increase their investment in pandemic preparedness, prevention, and response including by providing additional concessional funding. We also need to rapidly identify deployable resources for surge needs. The WHO contingency fund, for instance, should be increased to meet the US dollar 500 million day zero needs, including through a non-ODA source. But international financing should complement domestic financing, not replace it. However, as we all know, domestic financing, especially in low and middle income countries, is increasingly constrained by debt. The GPMB therefore supports recent calls, including from the Bridgetown Initiative, to address these barriers, supporting debt restructuring to improve debt sustainability and including natural disaster and pandemic clauses in all debt instruments could free funds for countries to invest in their own pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response mechanisms. Reforming global financing will also require improving its effectiveness. Long-term PPR financing will need to become more responsive to the needs and priorities of people and countries. Ensuring alignment and coordination across funders will also go a long way toward optimizing the effectiveness of financing. All this, as I mentioned before, involves progressive long-term reform, which must start now. The potential devastating impact on people, on economies, as well as overall development, means we can't afford to wait. I recognize that some of these recommendations are not simple to achieve, and so we stand ready as a board to answer any further questions you may have. But if you remember one thing today, it should be that right now, we cannot afford to be complacent on financing. Let me now hand over to Chris Elias for our third recommendation. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Joy. Equity and sustainability are at the core of responsible research, development, and delivery of healthcare products and solutions. Throughout my career in global health and development, I can attest to the importance of making sure that health innovations are not only developed, but delivered to communities, especially those communities that need them most. So it's my pleasure to present the GPMB's third recommendation on establishing baseline regional capabilities to drive more equitable and robust R&D and supply chains. R&D cannot be equitable and robust if it is overly concentrated in a small number of regions and countries. As we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, in times of crisis, countries have turned inwards, closed their borders, and hoarded medical countermeasures. Building PPPR capacities in all regions 
can ensure that countries have the capabilities they need closer to them and that no one is left behind when another pandemic hits. Our board recommends that all regions have, at a minimum, the following capabilities. One, the capacity for early detection and surveillance systems and laboratories. Two, the capacity to collect and analyze data before, during, and after health emergencies, as well as the capacity for agile stock management and basic manufacturing capabilities for pandemic-related products, including vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, and oxygen. Of course, regional institutions will have a very important role to play in driving the development of these capabilities. They can guide priorities, support the development of regional markets, and promote regulatory coordination between countries. Building regional capa capabilities will also require strengthening the capacity of low and middle income countries to deliver countermeasures to their populations, supporting them, for example, with financing and workforce retention. This regional approach can be reinforced by embedding a strong and effective global R&D framework in the WHO pandemic agreement. This can help ensure that investments are prioritized, that, that, um, uh, that they can be, uh, in innovations and knowledge can be shared across regions and that resources can be used effectively. The GPMB also recommends that the WHO develops, adopts a roadmap to operationalize the framework once agreed and publishes an updated list of R&D blueprint priority pathogens. An effective end-to-end R&D system will need to ensure that countermeasures get to the populations who need them, not only those that can pay. The public sector is one of the main funders of research and development for PPPR tools and therefore must ensure that manufacturers who have received these public funds have an obligation to support the populations in need. The GPMB recommends, therefore, that funders ensure that terms for equitable access to technologies, countermeasures, data, and information are included in their funding agreements. Pandemics are catastrophic risks that require that we all take actions to ensure our collective safety. And consequently, the private sector also has a key responsibility in the role for preparedness. By, con by participating in technology transfers, supporting regional capacity building, engaging in public-private collaborations, and providing more equitable terms of access, including fair pricing. The GPMB firmly believes in putting mechanisms in place for R&D access and access to countermeasures before health emergencies strike. Diligent preparedness leads to a more equitable response. I'll now pass to my colleague, Susanna Malcora, who's joining us virtually to speak about the GPMB's recommendations for multi-sectoral preparedness. Susanna? Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize for not being able to be uh, in Geneva today. I am very pleased to share with you the fourth key recommendation of this report on multi-sector coordination. I hope you see that on the screen. As former chef of the cabinet for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon during the West Africa Ebola outbreak, I saw many times how multi-sectoral coordination can be the linchpin of a successful health emergency response. Pandemics are not only a health matter. They are caused by environmental and socioeconomic factors like land use change or urban growth. Responding to them involves coordinating supply chains, addressing trade barriers, implementing social protection measures, and many others. They impact education system, economic growth, and geopolitics. During this West Africa Ebola outbreak and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the challenges posed when different sectors need to work together but have different ways of operating, different protocols, different imperatives, and no prior experience in coordination among themselves. This is why the GPMB fourth key recommendation which I hope you are seeing on the screen, 
is to develop a new approach to multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder engagement for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. This new approach is needed to bring together all stakeholders and sectors involved in PPPR and to support a more integrated, coherent response to pandemic and health emergencies. The GPMB calls on WHO in collaboration with key partners such as FAO, WHA, UNEP, UNDP, the World Bank, and others to work together to develop this approach. There are several existing models that can provide lessons learned, including the Sendai Framework Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction or the AMR Multi Stakeholder Partnership Platform. We believe that building this approach should begin immediately, even before the conclusions of the IMD negotiations. It is a must. This could help support the integration of multi-sectoral considerations into the pandemic agreement and provide support to the implementation of the agreement once it enters in force. On that note, I would like to thank you for your attention and conclude this section of, of the presentation on recommendation. Back to Colinda. My warmest thanks to Susanna and to preceding speakers for your reflections on the report. I'm pleased to now welcome a response from our GPMB co-conveners, the World Health Organization and the World Bank, and from the chair of the WHO Standing Committee on Health Emergency Prevention, Preparedness and Response. And first of all, I am delighted to invite Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, to make his remarks. Thank you, um, Your Excellency GPMB Co-Chair Kolinda Kitarovic, former President of Croatia, and GPMB Co-Chair Joy Fumafi, former Minister of Health of Botswana, Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah, Chair of the WHO Standing Committee on Health Emergency Prevention, Preparedness and Response, esteemed members of the GPMB, dear colleagues and friends. This is the fourth time I have had the opportunity to respond to a report from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, GPMB. The first was in September 2019 in New York, when you warned us of the threat and potential impact of a pandemic caused by a respiratory pathogen. Little did we know that COVID-19 was just around the corner. So it was two months after the report, actually, the uh, pandemic started. The second was in September 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, which meant that we had to meet virtually. You reported on the devastating consequences of the pandemic on lives and livelihoods. You were among the first to call for an international agreement on health emergency preparedness and response. It took two years, but the agreement is now moving forward. Next week, in this room, the, interna the intergovernmental negotiating body will begin, in the next, begin the next phase of its work on WHO pandemic agreement. The final draft is set to be presented at the World Health Assembly in May 2024. As I think you know, I have made clear to our member states that there is no time to waste. Another pandemic or global health emergency could come at any time, just as it did in 2019. This agreement is a momentous opportunity to transform pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. It's a generational agreement that must be written by the generation with the lived experience of a pandemic. However, I'm concerned that negotiations are progressing too slowly and that the agreement may not be ready in time for the World Health Assembly next year. I ask you to continue your advocacy with and for member states to work with a greater sense of urgency. 
with a particular focus on the most difficult issues of the pandemic accord. The third occasion for your last report was at the World Health Summit in 2021, where you reiterated many of your previous recommendations, including the call to establish a fund at the World Bank to provide a sustainable international financing for prevention, preparedness, and response. The pandemic fund came into being just a year later, hosted by the World Bank with WHO at the technical lead. So it's clear the GPMB has already made an important contribution to strengthening global preparedness through its reports and its advocacy. Of course, I highlighted the three, but you have made excellent other excellent recommendations. It's important that we look, for, we look closely at the recommendations in this report and take them seriously. And I will assure you that we take them seriously. And I have read the report with great interest and I welcome all of your recommendations. These are critically important areas that require urgent action. I want to focus on the first recommendation, your call for independent monitoring and accountability mechanisms to be embedded in the ongoing reforms, including the WHO pandemic agreement. I agree with you. In fact, it was the need for independent monitoring that impelled then World Bank President Jim Kim and I set up the GPMB in 2018. You cannot have accountability without monitoring, which provides accurate and timely information for turning commitments into effective action. Four years ago, you told us the world was not prepared. You have told us today that not enough has changed despite the catastrophic consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. And I very much share that concern. But I would also like to note the important progress that has been made against GPMB's recommendations. This includes the pandemic fund, as I said earlier, the negotiations for the pandemic agreement, a very important milestone and game changer, the logistics hub in Dubai, and increasing regional capacities for research and development for, the, for sustainable manufacturing with the mRNA technology uh, transfer hub in South Africa and the global training hub for biomanufacturing in the Republic of Korea. And for improving information sharing, analytics and decision making, we established the WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin and the WHO bio hub, which is being uh, piloted. To engage communities and civil society, WHO established the, U, the WHO Youth Council and the Civil Society Commission. To increase accountability, we established the peer-to-peer -peer universal health preparedness review, which is also being piloted actually. And to build a stronger WHO, our member states made a historic commitment to increase access contributions to provide sustainable financing for the organization. And before I end, we are at a major turning point for GPMB as we are now passing the leadership torch. My sincere gratitude to Ian Smith, who has led GPMB for four years, GPMB Secretariat, with a steadfast hand, keen intelligence, and grace. I hope you will agree with me. Your wisdom, Ian, Deep experience and economy have made an invaluable contribution to this crucial project, and we thank you for that. And we welcome Dr. Sylvie Brion, who is taking the helm with her extensive scientific background, knowledge of WHO and international institutions, and long leadership experience. And welcome, Sylvie, and we look forward to the new era. I thank our co-chairs and the members of the GPMB for your time and expertise to help us progress towards a fairer, healthier, and safer, the safer world uh, for all. I thank you, and uh, Madam President, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for your response, for your remarks, and for your call for urgent action.
And I do join you on behalf of the whole board in thanking Ian and welcoming Sylvie. Uh, and now I'm pleased to now uh, to welcome Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah, Chair of the WHO Standing Committee on Health Emergency Prevention, Preparedness and Response to provide his response. Uh, thank you, uh, Director General Dr. Tedros, GPMB Co-Chair Belinda Kitarovic and Joy Mumafi, Your Excellency, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to uh, thank and express my sincere gratitude for the privilege of participating in this launch of the 2023 GPMP report on the state of the world preparedness. On behalf of WHO Standing Committee on Health Emergency Prevention, Preparedness and Response, I extend our appreciation to the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board for this significant event. We want to commend uh, GPMP, an independent entity responsible for evaluating the global pandemic preparedness and health emergency response. The insights and recommendations being presented in this report have been eagerly anticipated. The recent challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and other health emergencies have provided us with a unique chance to assess and fortify our health system and address the unmet, um, unmet needs of the member states. The primary role of the WHO Shepherd Committee is to provide guidance and support the WHO Health Emergencies Program, particularly in the realms of the prevention, preparedness and response, in alignment with our committee's terms of reference documented in EB 151-2-2022. Collaboration with other organisations, particularly independent entities like GPMB, is vital. Our decision-making is inclusive and collective, making it fitting to leverage uh, the GPMP 2023 report and based on the indicators and recommendation framework. This report, however, highlights substantial weaknesses and declining preparedness capacities in crucial areas alongside fragile signs of improvement that needs immediate attention and reinforcement. Now is the ideal time to foster cooperation and collaboration among organizations to address these significant gaps in managing health emergencies. It is crucial that we remain united and coherent in our approach to fulfill our responsibilities and prevent the redundancy across various committees and organizations. To better prepare for the future, we must prioritize the key findings and recommendations in this report focusing on technical solutions to address the highlighted gaps and prevent disruption to our healthcare system. Simplicity and practicality should guide our amicable solutions. I strongly believe that together we can overcome these challenges. Once again, I extend my gratitude to GPMP's leadership and board members for this 2023 report launch. With that, thank you for your attention. Our many thanks to you, Dr. Abdullah. And finally, before we move to questions, we have a short message from Dr. Juan Pablo Uribe on behalf of the World Bank Group. Dear Joy, dear Kalinda, dear GPMB members, dear all, apologies for not being with you for the launch of the new GPMB report and for this upcoming board meeting. We are proud to be here in the World Bank together with WHO co-conveners of the GPMB, which over the last five years has become an important independent voice for better pandemic prevention and preparedness and has played a crucial role throughout the COVID pandemic. The launch of the New World Preparedness Report with its fragility title fills a critical gap because it is based on a new monitoring framework which aptly assesses a well prepared world is across multiple needed domains. I'm certain that the report will generate a lot of healthy debate about the documented gaps, what needs to be done to address them, as well as the methodology that underpins the assessment, among others. What's clear is that pandemic preparedness and disease surveillance anchored in strong health systems that reach all people, especially the most vulnerable, are crucial to ensuring better protection from major disease outbreaks. While the report rightly highlights significant shortcomings in both domestic and international financing for PPR investments, 
we believe that things are overall moving in the right direction. We're seeing strong interest from World Bank clients, and we have a solid pipeline of projects that provide significant financing to strengthen preparedness. Crisis preparedness is integral to the mission of the World Bank. We're committed to supporting countries on this agenda, and we're in it for the long term. With our recently announced Health Emergency Global Challenge Program, we're rethinking how the World Bank can deliver better, bigger, and more effective support in this critical public good. Along with IDA, with IFC, with MEGA, this Global Challenge Program will bring large-scale and sustainable improvements for health systems to prevent, detect, and respond to disease outbreaks and AMR challenges and provide effective care, again, especially for the most marginalized communities. And we are proud to host the Pandemic Fund, which brings additional dedicated resources for PPR and incentivizes countries to increase their investments. As you well know, the first round of funding has been allocated to 37 countries through 19 projects that have already started. A strong recognition here to WHO for their leadership of the Technical Advisory Panel. In addition, the World Bank is working on better instruments for search and response financing in times of crisis, also through its evolution roadmap process and with the close leadership of G20 and G7 and the collaboration again together with WHO. With this positive forward-looking view, recognizing fragility and recognizing still gaps and limitations, in spite of so many challenges around the world, I do wish the board successful meetings over the coming days and look forward to learning the outcomes of the discussions. Your independent voice monitoring pandemic preparedness is extremely important. Thank you. Many thanks to uh, Dr. Uribe and many thanks to uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, and of course uh, to Dr. Abdullah for your responses to our report. And I'm pleased to now invite questions from audience members. And as a, remember, as a reminder, I beg your pardon, questions may be posted using the chat feature on Zoom. Um, and uh, we have our first question already from Dr. Ngashi Ngongo uh, of the Africa CDC. And his question is this, the equity focus of this report requires disaggregated analysis by regions to see areas of greatest vulnerability. Can you please comment on the status of preparedness in Africa and other regions? Have you considered an index to compare the level of preparedness by region and by country to guide the response to boost preparedness? And as a follow-up, would you also consider including the assessment of the status of preparedness of national health systems and regional institutions in future reports? Um, I know this is something that Africa has been working on, so uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Maha El Rabat to, to respond about what has been happening in that region. But it is an area that uh, we have highlighted in the report that there is um, a challenge with access to data and with availability of data. But Maha, over to you to respond to the question. I apologize. I think uh, we, we have probably lost uh, Maha. Um, Ibrahim, can you address the question, please? I, I'm afraid I just rejoined. Uh, what is the question? The equity focus of the report requires disaggregated analysis by regions to see areas of greatest vulnerability. So the question is that can we comment on the status of preparedness in regions like Africa? 
and, and have we considered an index to compare the level of preparedness in the different regions? So as the report rightly uh, articulates, um, we are not where we are with equity, and certainly we are not where we are with the collect where we should be with the collection of data on equity and the distribution of resources. We do know uh, that the situation in, is inequitable and um, dimensions of equity are included in um, our monitoring framework. Um, we also recognize that in particular, the African continent is behind both in terms of the equity of distribution of resources in terms of preparedness, but also in the collection of appropriate data to ensure that um, we're able to monitor progress towards equity. We believe that using the metrics that we've set out in the report would provide the framework to work with partners such as um, WHO, Regional Office for Africa, and the Africa CDC, and national governments um, to appropriately refine uh, the metrics needed for the African continent. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you here at um, Addis Ababa uh, because I believe that engagement with regional stakeholders is the way we refine the metrics that we've designed at the global level to be regionally appropriate. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. And so, uh, Dr. Ngongo, we really look forward to working to your leadership as the Africa CDC in improving this area. I know it is an area that you are working hard on with national governments. Um, and uh, what we will be doing as a follow-up to this report is uh, monitoring progress in the implementation of our recommendations, including this particular area. And we look forward to um, uh, reporting on the progress that you have made and the region will have made uh, in, our next, uh, in our next report. Um, we have not yet received additional questions. Um, so I encourage you to please uh, continue to ask questions. Um, but uh, in the meantime, there was a, a, a question which was asked um, previously about the elements uh, that uh, should be integrated, uh, the key element that should be integrated into um, the WHO pa pandemic agreement um, to ensure that the recommendations of this report are implemented. And of course, the key element is the monitoring. Um, so um, I would like to maybe um, pass this uh, question on to, um, I don't know, either my co-chair or Elena Kekbush to, to respond to this uh, importance of monitoring, because our co-chair talked about it earlier on. Well, thank you, Joy. And uh, as everyone knows, uh, monitoring and accountability are very difficult issues. Everybody says uh, they would like more monitoring, they want to know more about their neighbor, but not always are they uh, just as willing to share their own data. I think there's a number of issues here why some countries are hesitant. Uh, that is, of course, experiences that uh, if rankings are made uh, between countries as to advancement on uh, uh, preparedness and monitoring, those rankings, of course, are um, unjust in a certain way, because if you don't have the resources to fulfill the commitments, you, of course, land at the bottom of the pile. And uh, we have those problems with rankings if you also take the Human Development Report or if you take the Sustainable Development Goals. So we need to find a solidaric way uh, to do this. And I think this is the challenge uh, for uh, the, uh, the pandemic agreement. Uh, in our work on the Lancet Commission on Governing Health Futures, we have used the term data solidarity. We have said that we need to find a form where we can entrust each other with the information without having to fear negative consequences if we give that information. And I think really these two issues are those that are holding us back in the accord. This injustice of I can't be better because I'm not being helped on the one hand, and this fact if I give the data, there have been instances where uh, 
the, uh, the response has again been uh, uh, unjust. And uh, so the link between monitoring and equity and uh, between the supportive initiatives of financing and governance that we have outlined is one that needs to be resolved. I think it can be resolved through this understanding of solidarity because only then will we all be safe. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it needs a willingness from all sides uh, so you are not ostracized on the one hand, but that you are helped if you are in a difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilona. We have a question from uh, Jack Otieno. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. And the question is, have you considered the role of the private sector in future pandemic preparedness, given that governments, particularly in the global south and public health agencies, face numerous challenges, including limited resources and limited reach within and beyond their national borders. I'd like to give the question over to Chris and to Victor to answer. Chris. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Dr. Hotiano, for the question. You know, as I, as I said briefly in my remarks, I think the private sector has a very important role to play. It has historically played a, a critical role in driving innovations. Um, and some of the, the, the achievements that uh, Victor highlighted in his comments about, and, and are highlighted in the report about how quickly vaccines were developed. The problem is that is how do we ensure that that innovation, those innovations um, um, are equitably accessible? Um, and I think we've seen some unfortunate uh, lapses in that uh, ability, despite well-intended you know, statements, where there, because there wasn't a framework in place for equitable access to countermeasures ahead of time, we stumbled in uh, uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think there's a real opportunity in the, in the pandemic agreement, and, and those are challenging negotiations, as we've heard from, from Dr. Tedros, um, uh, to, to come out with a fair and equitable framework for harnessing the, the incredible capability of, of the private sector to drive science and technological innovation into producing countermeasures that are available for everyone. And that's going to require really looking at the, uh, the, the consequences of how do we share those innovations through technology transfers? How do we ensure equitable access through uh, um, uh, agreements such as the, the pandemic influenza uh, uh, partnership that, that Bente highlighted? So we have some good examples that I think we can build on and try to instantiate in the pandemic agreement as it's concluded over the next several months. Over. Thank you, Chris. Victor? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question. And I quite agree with uh, Chris and many of his comments. Certainly, we know that many of the innovations I mentioned earlier, like mRNA and uh, diagnostic therapeutics, are driven by the private sector. So, so it's realistically, I think it has to be a private-public partnership because I don't think that uh, many of the countries have enough uh, resources to be able to actually develop, nor for that matter, disseminate many of the innovations. So I think reaching an agreement with the private sector is so important. As Chris pointed out, innovation, tech transfer, and even capacity building, particularly in training of the workforce in, for example, mRNA technology, you name it. Um, I think it's essential that they get involved very early. Essential there's an agreement of how they should play. And I think the Berlin Declaration is at least a starting point. In my uh, experience with the Regional Vaccine Manufacturing Capacity Collaborative, we worked long with the private sector along with public sector. And it's very clear that I think market shaping is a very important issue, de-risking the private sector as well. So the question really is, how do you bring the private sector in early in looking at the issue of equity and access? And how do you actually de-risk them and work on a market shaping idea? This is where I think that many sectors, including Gavi 
including SEPI, many others can be playing a very important role in working with, along with them and government to look at how to engage them very early in some of the development. In terms of regional capacity, there's no question that it's really difficult for regions to achieve all the platforms of innovation without a collaboration with private sector. So I come back to what Chris is saying, Ilona is saying that I think in the, uh, in the um, accord, in the understanding of public-private partnership, it's really important that we know how they play with us and how, in fact, they will work along with the private sec public sector and also, reversely, how the public sector can help them de-risk and look at market shaping, procurement, and you name it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor and Chris. Um, we have a, the third, third question, which will make our last, um, which is from uh, Zander. Um, and uh, first of all, Zander appreciates the rich and valuable um, uh, critical and critical agenda that has been that the board has put before the global community in the report, uh, particularly that we are in a cycle of uh, panic and neglect, and uh, the, there's a fragile state of preparedness. Uh, given this, uh, he asks, do you think the most progress will be made before the, that more the, the most progress will be made bef, be, be, before the publication of the next report? Uh, how can partners support GPMB over the next year to build a political will for action? So um, I know my co-chair is going to address this uh, in, her, in her closing remarks, uh, but uh, I would like to give Mark and Susanna a minute each to address this. Starting with you, Susanna. Thank you, Joy. I'll be very brief. Um, we have a deep hope that by the time we get to our next report out, we will be able to show advancement. But this requires deep commitments, and uh, we do not necessarily see that urge of commitments. So our call is to bring people to people's attention that we are out of time, and Dr. Tedros said that in his introduction, and we desperately need to work on coming together beyond the many differences and the many reasons for those differences. And we also need, and this is very important, the reference to partners, for partners to support this call, because um, as I said, we do not have time. Thank you. Mark? Thank you very much, Joy. And it's a fantastic question. We as a board can advise and recommend. Lots of us on this board used to be decision makers. We are now mostly advisors and people who can recommend. So the answer to the question depends on what all of you watching us today decide to do to lobby and mobilize your decision makers. Uh, so thank you for raising it. It really matters what happens on these recommendations, but what happens is not primarily on, in our hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, so, Colinda is not primarily in our hands, um, but uh, would like to thank our, uh, our uh, colleagues who responded to the questions and thank you uh, the listeners and participators for the important questions and critical questions that you have asked. But I would like to pass uh, the chair now to my co-chair, President Colinda, for the final remarks. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, everyone, for attending the launch of GPMB's 2023 report on the state of um, world's preparedness. We appreciate your engagement with us and your continuing commitment to health emergency preparedness. For those of you with questions that we did not answer today, we look forward to continuing our dialogue on the report and its findings. And I take the opportunity to invite everyone watching today to assume their responsibility for implementing the recommendations, conclusions, and next steps that we have presented in our report. 
So the report that we have presented today has shown that world remains inadequately prepared for the next pandemic. To prevent it, we must act now. Again, everyone participating can contribute to turning these important recommendations into action. And we urge you to do just that. Thank you. I would also ask one for Ian. Thank you.